right now. No problem. Kara Swisher, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, you've been probably the closest observer of Silicon Valley as a journalist for, mm -hmm. for a long time now. Sure. Um, I guess the one of the main things that I want to figure out in our conversation is to what extent uh, Silicon Valley and the internet and social media have caused some of our political problems today, and to some extent, and to what extent they're actually epiphenomenal, to what extent they're just driven by broader and deeper political developments and polarization um, that then sort of influence what Twitter and <laughs> Facebook and so on look like. Um, Absolutely. I, I think I'll start with the second first, because I think one of the things that there's a couple things that get left out. I don't blame social media for everything by any stretch. And I think nobody should, because it's a reflection of humanity in some level. And I, I was thinking about this the other day when everyone was like, see, this is what social media did. I was like, you know, Hitler didn't need social media to get his point through. Neither did Mussolini, neither did Stalin. I mean, these things have been present in our world through globally, through throughout history. Nobody needs this particular system. Uh, but there are some elements of this particular system that do take what already was a problem and 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 supersize it. I don't want to use a, like a fast food metaphor, but it's kind of is like that. And I, I think one of the first articles I wrote for the New York Times was about this was the weaponization and the amplification issues around these particular tools. And so whatever tool you get, whether it's the printing press or television or radio, uh, it, they, amp they, they amplify something more. And so in... Franklin Delano Roosevelt's case or Winston Churchill and a good thing radio really did amplify and amplify their ability to reach people directly, especially with unfettered and directly. And that's one of the key parts of this. Um, and then you get to Hitler and Mussolini and you get newsreels, right? They use newsreels really well to push their point of view. Um, unfettered for the most part for a lot of it. Um, and then you sort of fast forward to television and obviously John F. Kennedy had, had, had it, we used those correctly and used it well and, and other, Ronald Reagan, I think was a master of that in terms of performance and getting his point of view through. And what has happened is there's, there's two things. Those are all mediums that pushed towards you, right? They're, they're one way, one way. When you have this kind of- they uh, they play Shirky calls one too many yeah, communication. One too many, right. But this is- every, and broadcast out, yeah. And so it changes it. That's one part. The other part is that it's unfettered in a way that's never been possible before, where there is absolutely no one in the way. It's not a mistake that Trump did so well on Twitter because it was an unfettered way to get his point of view through. Even if it was offensive, it got through. When he was ever, when he was in his, you know, a setting with reporters, there was, uh, there was friction. And so no friction was really good for Donald Trump. Because when there's friction, he said things like hydroxychloroquine or disinfectant. And, you know, he just, it, any pushback was a problem for him. And so, uh, and because it started to call into question what he was saying. And so unfettered is really an important part of this. And unfettered at the speed that it is and the size that it is and the ability to reach is the problem. It, so mm -hmm. you, you've taken a problem that we've had with humanity and you put it on steroids and you put it in a way that is highly manipulable compared. You have to own a television station. You have to own a radio station. You have to own a newsprint. Newsreels are hard. This is just, this puts the tools in the hands of people, especially malevolent players that are gaming it almost continually. And the way it is built, everybody's a customer of them, right? Even malevolent players, anti, I, I would consider anti-vax people malevolent. I would consider Marjorie, whatever, Taylor Green, malevolent. Um, she can use those tools equally. And that's the real problem is that everyone gets access to these incredibly powerful tools. And it depends on the person how they're going to use those tools. And so with no rules and no regulations and no nothing, this is what you get. And some of it's good. Like, look, the Bernie meme this weekend. Was this the best thing ever? The Bernie meme was the best thing ever. There's a good example of humanity having fun, enjoying creativity. And then you get Trump lying about the election continually and excessively since the election. He had other, of course, was terrible before, but after it, it created, it had a speed that was very intense. And then it was pushed up the stack and down the stack and up the stack. And that's what, that's the power of this particular medium. So I think I have, I have, I have two questions that come out of that. One is sort of minor, but I think it's interesting to pursue for a minute. Um, and then I have a deeper one. So the minor one is about whether or not Trump thrived because Twitter didn't mediate what he said, mm -hmm. or whether the pushback he received on different kind of media platforms actually helped him. I mean, I always had the feeling in 2016 
that even when he said things that according to every poll, a majority of Americans disliked, mm -hmm. it helped him because, sure. you know, when you think of, uh, uh, of, 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 of an Access Hollywood tape, for example, mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that most Americans found that particularly nice or likable. I, or common. I agree, but I don't um, bother. As but well. I think the fact that every established politician, including the Republican Party, then rightly and understandably pushed back against the tape and said, well, that's mm -hmm. disgusting and so on, actually helped him. Because yeah. the distrust and the dislike for the political class is so deep in America and in most developed democracies, by the way. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people thought, you know, look, what Trump said there was not nice. I don't like that. But you know what, if all of these people are against him, if all of these people whom I hate, hate him, there, there must be something right about him. There must be something appealing about him. So I guess, he, I'm I not have... sure that he, that, 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 that sort of, to him, social media was more valuable than, sure. than the debates or was more valuable than CNN. Because I think- The, whole, oh, I think the whole thing. It was the whole thing. Although he did get in a lot more trouble when he started to do those COVID you know what I mean? Those were fettered, some fe those COVID briefings. Because then people were like, what a fucking clown and I'm dying. You know what I mean? Like that, right, right. I do think- But that may be the context and maybe the stakes of the- Exactly. Of, of, so I don't think it, I think it, the combination of all these things is what matters and his use of them. Though I would say in the case of the, the pussy tape, whatever, I, I think that failed because I think a lot of women have men that act badly and you and and when when they got attacked by everyone saying this is terrible you're kind of saying to a lot of people you idiot you put up with that like it, there was a lot going on there and a lot of men had some have issues not all of them and nobody's like you know there's people like him but not, a, not everybody's like him everyone has a discomfort with that and so i think that everyone was having a moment for themselves like in that regard in when clinton people really attacked uh, people who were for him for that I thought you're attacking women who've put up with shitty men forever and there's a lot of those <laughs> you know what I mean like I I'm an idiot you have to admit you're an idiot and I think one of the things he did was he dared us uh, to look at ourselves a lot more than you think you know like oh maybe I did something like that and so I think it's a lot more complex with him there's no question one of the problems with a lot of every time he got into trouble, and I do think it, it added up over time, was when he was pushed back on. The problem, the problem that people who push back on fact checkers or whoever, like every time trying to fact check him, essentially, the problem that was was I was watching the the Kellyanne Conway interview with Bill Maher the other night, and I mm -hmm. and I was thinking of people because a lot of these people want to talk on my show, and I thought. Wow, he pushed back at about 25% of her bullshit, but 75% got through. So what's that? Like she won, right? As far as I'm concerned, she won that particular thing. He didn't get her. He didn't like win. He didn't like, oh, he got one off on her. I think that's the issue is that if you're in a position where you're willing to lie and be shameless most of the time, you win because people can't, can't I mean, stop you. There is, I think, a sort of... I mean, that's, that, that's, that's the difference between a traditional political lie and what mm -hmm. we have now, which I think we still don't have quite the right term, right? So a traditional political lie is, you know... No new text. Did you, did you, did you have an affair? No, of course not, right? You want, people, you want people to have a wrong belief about this mm -hmm. very specific thing that might harm you, right? Is it your fault that this, you know, bad attack happened? No, no, you know, we weren't informed. Actually, you had a briefing, but, you know, you yeah. want people to be upset about that. I think there is a different... Um, a thing which 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 is a little bit like you know why is it so hard to have effective anti-rocket missiles? Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually quite easy to have anti-rocket missiles that hit you know a small number of nuclear warhead empowered yeah, rockets. Yeah, one one it, will ruin your day. Well, one will ruin your day. But the other thing is you know what if the enemy sends a thousand rockets and only yeah. five of them are nuclear enabled, but you don't know which ones, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think there's something similar about the prospect of lying. You know, any one lie that populists spread, you can deal with. Mm -hmm. But but when they have a hundred lies over the course of a couple of months, nobody pays enough attention, nobody it reads enough fact checkers, nobody can in. read up on enough things to sort of squat right. down each of them. And so right. some will get through, right? There's a kind of weird but it's not just that it's sinking in. It's the, repet you know, very famous propagandists have talked about this, the continual saying of the lie over and over and over again, because it does get pick up. And I think that was when I was watching him uh, right after the, by the way, throughout the time he was egregious, but he was really egregious right after the election because he kept 
he kept repeating the thing over and over and over and over again. And that's where I thought, oh, they got to do something. This is this is like full scale propaganda war he's doing. And then his minions repeated it. And so it was sort of step and repeat, step and repeat, step and repeat. And so it, it was sort of classic what he was doing, even if it was wrong. Um, and because the sites would sort of label him badly disputed, what does that mean? Like most, I don't even, no one knows that word. What does disputed mean? Like two people arguing over it or is it a bait or whatever? Um, Cause they sort of took half measures that would sort of led into his ability to, to for it, if they had taken just one measure originally, it would not a long time ago, it would not have been a problem. This would not have been, cause he would have been stopped. But once you're not stopped and you keep- well, so, so what does that mean? I mean, it's, it's not clear to me exactly. So, so look, like I prefer, um, if it's really obvious right. that a politician has lied, uh, yeah. and you're, I'm saying that they lied. I think, it, it, you know, sometimes when there's a risk of becoming too trigger happy and and, mm -hmm. and of having two different standards, and I certainly think there's been some shocking fact checks in which... Right. Agree. Um, uh, you're not going to get them right. Organizations have sort of actually gone very far to not label democratic politicians as lying in context yeah. of the Republican politician or whatever. Done. But like, that's fine by me. Let's say that Trump lied when he lied, and he clearly lied many, 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 many times while mm -hmm. in office. My instinct is not that that would help anything because the people who, you know, because A, actually it's not the readers of the New York Times who believe Trump's lies by and large. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. some of them don't believe some of them, but, right. right? And, 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 and B, I think it just reads to everybody who likes him as, oh, so now the New York Times is completely against him. Right. And why should we trust anything the New York Times says? I'm not saying it's the worst cause of action. I just, my prior is not that it would make a big difference. Well, except it did. The minute they took him off, look what happened. The num the amount of misinformation declined precipitously. Well, that's a different question. That's, that's not about whether whether we label him as having lied or, mm -hmm. or or whatever. That's a question of whether or not we should kick him off of Twitter, which I want to get to, but I want to get to sure. it a little bit later. That's sure. okay. But let me get back to, to something you said earlier. I said I was going to have two questions about the very sure. first thing you said. I want to get back to the other thing. Was it clarified something in my mind, right? 25, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. we had this structure of communication that was one too many. So- yep. Um, in order to reach a large audience, you had to have access to, um, you know, the column inches of the New York Times or yep. the broadcast, broadcast studio of CNN or ABC, et cetera, et cetera. And because those were very resource intensive, um, there was a kind of form of editorial control, right? Mm -hmm. There was a set of people um, who got to exercise discretion over who I had... Always, I always call it 16 white guys on the Upper East Side of New York. Go ahead. Yeah. No, exactly. So, so, yeah. so that had real disadvantages because it well, obviously was people who were affluent and powerful and who were not demographically representative of the U.S. population, and there's all kinds of problems with it. But it also had good elements, which is that you know they probably wouldn't have put Mar Marjorie Taylor Brown on the air, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so as a result, you didn't have a stark a conflict between something like the First Amendment and what got through to people, because there was mm -hmm. these sort of informal decision-making mechanisms. Yes, informal, that exactly. sort of distinguished between what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, right? Yeah, um, gatekeepers, it's called gatekeepers. Yeah, sure. Right. Um, so, so I guess what, what I'm trying to think through is what happens when those gatekeepers are gone? Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and how do we, so I get the argument that, look, we need a form of informal control again. Now, I think there's a real question about whether the, the gatekeepers we would appoint today would be any better than the ones we had sure. 20 years ago and whether they wouldn't also create all kinds of problems. I want to get to that. Um, but, but it's also, you know, how do you formalize that when, when it doesn't exist informally? Um, how do you do that without giving up on on the First Amendment and some of the basic values in the political right, system. Right. Like. Well, let's be clear on the First Amendment, what it is. Like, it's it's an idea of free speech that doesn't exist, actually, that we, we convince ourselves as Americans that it is. It's very clear. It's Congress. The government shouldn't make laws governing, abridging freedom of speech. That is what it says. It does not. There's a broad feeling that we should let free speech reign wherever we can, but it is not a requirement when it comes to Facebook or Twitter. And a judge just ruled just, just now on um, on Amazon does, doesn't have to host Parler. They don't have to. They don't have to host anything. They don't want to. Same thing with Facebook, same thing with Twitter. So I'd like yeah, to keep so that. So right. So there's, so there's two different sets of questions. It is, right? but so it always gets, is... what, what, they te what the social media companies do is very craftily mix it in there as if that's, that's a thing, right? And so that abrogates them from the responsibility of what they built. But, and but, but to me, but to me, there's a little bit of a catch-22 here, mm -hmm. right? Because 
um, that means that there's two worlds of regulation mm -hmm. that we might have, right? So, if we, so, so let's get to the heart of, okay, so, so, so Twitter and Facebook want to ban certain people from the platform. Um, including some people who are elected politicians, including some people who, when they were banned, were still president of the United States, right? Um, how do we do that in a way that doesn't abridge on our political liberties and uh, is, 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 is minimally fair um, if we believe that, that it would, in fact, have good results, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk right. about what the right. impact is later. Fine. So I think that's a, that's a reasonable question. It's a question that I ask myself, too. It seems to me there's, broadly speaking, two kinds of worlds. One is that you actually have some form of representative government institution that has power over that, right? It's never um, happened. That's never how happened. many countries around the world are yes, doing. Yes, not so this one. It's yeah, not going no. to happen in the United States because it would require giving up on the First Amendment. Yes, exactly. Right? Um, and I think actually I, I do think the First Amendment is important and, and for America's political culture is absolutely right and appropriate and we should defend it. So, so that's so, a no-go in the United sure. States. But then the alternative is that for really rich and powerful and affluent people in Silicon Valley, who you know well from years of dinner parties and and, and reporting, and mm -hmm. who you're quite critical of, mm -hmm. get to make a decision in our Agreed. state. Agreed. And even though I agree that that's not technically a problem from the First Amendment perspective, I do think it's a real problem Agreed. from a broader political freedom and, and free speech perspective. So that's I, why I find myself... Yes, sort of, of course. I was saying that... Pathetic ...to wanting to shut up conspiracy theories on the internet... But I have to say, so far, I don't see a way of doing that that doesn't give up too many other things. 100%. Now, I'd like to go back a little bit. We were talking about uh, before that's the way it was done when it was the New York Times, CBS, ABC, and NBC. It was literally 33 white men who lived in one zip code, essentially. So we had that, even though, and that was, and we never said they shouldn't control their mediums, by the way. We never know what people did, but for the most part, that's the way we lived. And so we've been living with this more longer than you imagine. Everything has been decided by either, whether it's Rupert Murdoch or um, whoever ran CBS or whoever ran the New York Times, or the Salzburgers. It's always been that way. Yeah, even and though, one of the results was that we barely got, you know, stories and representation that is of, exactly of right. people that's in this right. country, for example. And I don't the, like the, it. The right revolution we got over the last 25 I years. Don't like I don't like it at all. I don't like it at all. So I'm just saying we've been there. We, 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 if we think right. this is different, it's not. It's just a smaller group of people, right? So one of the things I always was saying when, when after the Harler thing happened, it was like, oh, you or, or Trump, you must be happy. I'm like, Here's what I'm happy. They made the right decision in this case, but I don't like that they got to, they are the only people that got to make the decision. So I tried to separate the two things. It was just giving them a pat on the back for the right decision. Fine. That they did make the right decision in this case. We're right in being banning Trump and, he and getting violence. violence. He incited that. violence. He, he crossed the really red line of those companies, you know, child pornography, terrorism, and inciting violence. He went, you know, he went over the line. That was so clear. I was good with that decision, but, and I think most people were or can see that it was the reasonable decision to make. The problem is, is that the power is concentrated so heavily in a, such a small group of people that we have to do something about that. And I think the only solution is not to go back to like the CBS, ABC, maybe there were 10 of those. There needs to be, we have to promote innovation. So there's lots of places for different voices and different standards to happen. And so there's not one coalesced, coalesced place where the funnel comes down to where one guy like Mark, and I think he's really the only one who counts here in a lot of ways, because Twitter is small but noisy. Um, one guy gets to decide everything. And and because there is no competition in social media, there's no competition in e-commerce, I think you can argue, although Jeff Bezos would argue differently. Um, there's no commerce in, there's no, uh, there's no competition in search. So that's where I want to focus on is this like all the right wing wants to talk about banning and bias. It's crap. There's no evidence of the case. What it, the problem is, is concentration of power. It's always concentration of power, whether we're talking about oil or telco or trains or whatever we're talking about, concentration of power or razor blades. I don't care. That's the problem. So, so, so let's, let's put the conversation into, in, into two parts, right? Mm -hmm. The first of which is under the really imperfect circumstances mm -hmm. in which let's say two people essentially can decide who gets to yeah. speak to the great American public and who does not in the ways that now is most natural to people, which you yes. know, is like Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg essentially yeah. between them, right? You think it's a public square, it's do, not. Do, do we think that it is good for those uh, platforms to 
to, to shut down political voices that I personally find loathsome and very dangerous, but that, that, that are elected by, by majorities in the districts, uh, in the states, or sometimes by, uh, you know... The, you ask me if you think it's good? The reality of a well, minority, but, but, but the relevant number of Americans to become president. And I have to say that I just don't think I'm there. You know, you don't get a say in it. See, the thing is, we all think we get a say in this. It's a private company. It is a private, like, again and again, I say this. It's like, and I, you I may not like it, but the right. build so your own friggin' company. Else. Like that, that, that's the only part. Sarah, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have moral judgments about what companies oh, do. All I, I just right? said that. We, the do concept... have, we do get to have a moral say. I don't have. But we don't really have a say, say, do we? I mean, we can say what we want, but we don't have an influence. And so I, I don't, I think concentration in, as I have said for years, and everybody gives me a hard time for is concentration in the hands of an unelected, not unelected. I don't care about the unelected part, an unfireable non-accountable person is the problem. And so why don't we give them some accountability that's correct for what they are, which is liability, which is an ability to sue them. You know, sue the bastard is a really good way to deal with chemical companies. It was a good way to deal with cigarette companies. It was a good way to deal with auto. Sue the bastard. That's where that's where I want to focus in, not on the government taking its dirty mitts and and moving their hands throughout this. And and I also, you need to educate the public that they do not, this is not a public square as much as you wish, you know, if wishes were horses, uh, it just isn't. It's just not what it is. And so we have to get off that idea. Well, but, that, I mean, in one sense, it clearly is. It functions as the public. But it square. isn't. For but it moment, is. Absolutely. So, so, so it doesn't the matter is, if it functions. As long as it functions essentially like the public square, but it's not. what kind of norms would apply to it? And I, and, and I do think that, that as long as that is the case, some of the same norms should apply to it as should apply to what kind of protests we should allow in the center of town. Sure, and but media companies of, have laws on them. There are lots of protests in the center of town that I found deeply offensive, but I but will defend the right to have those protests there because right. that is what it is to live in a, in a free society. Now, I agree with you. One of the ways to deal with that is to make sure that the public square isn't effectively owned by two people. But it's um, not, see, again, you're, you're, I'm not even going to posit it. It's not the public square. So what do we do to a private company that has enormous power? We have been down this road as Americans hundreds of times before, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's John D. Rockefeller. We know how to deal with this. And that's liability, accountability, ability to sue. You know, the media companies, the New York Times, it's governed by libel laws. There's a, there's a governor on the New York Times. There's a governor on chemical companies. There's there's a way to stop this by not, but, but to pretend that that they are public squares and say and be all indignant about it is is fine. Be indignant, but they're not public square. They're still like I wish they were a public square because then we could do something about it. But they're not. And so, what do we want to do then? Well, what are our hands? These are private companies. There's no laws in place to govern internet companies. The only laws in place uh, help them. And so, let's come up with a set of regulations that is that that. The only way I can see it is two things. Pr promote innovation so that there's more voices and more companies, which is always better. More is always better. And two, liability, lawyers. Let's get the lawyers in here and start to private lawyers to come in here and start to work their magic. So, so, so let's, let's talk through those two things because, because I, I, you know, at this level of, of, of abstraction, I absolutely agree with you. So, um, you know, how do we get enough innovation that there isn't one company owning right. uh, the public square? Um, mm -hmm. but, but, but that there really is lots of different companies. And in particular, mm -hmm. uh, how does that work in realms where there's clearly a very strong network effect, right? I mean, clearly yeah. the point about social media platforms is that I want to be on a social media platform that everybody else is on sure. um, because otherwise I can't reach most people. And so, um, you know, isn't this an area where no matter how much innovation we have, perhaps we'll, we'll allow a challenger to beat the incumbents and that might have all kinds of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but the fact that the challenger beats the incumbent doesn't necessarily solve a problem because then we go from Facebook and Twitter being the quasi-public square to whatever next privately owned company being the sure. quasi-public square. And that doesn't actually solve a structural uh, driver of, of... I think we've been through this. I think, you know, you could make that... Ar it's always better not to have competition if you're a chemical company or a, or a phone company. That was the argument. And the, let's not break up the phone. You need this. And what's fascinating, we always do this. No, with no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not making no about better, it. It would be good to have four different social media platforms. I'm just saying, isn't there an inherent uh, platform mm -hmm. effect which, which will tend people to congregate on one social media platform at least for particular spheres. No, so if I don't wants to be on politics, wants to be on the media platform, 
where, where everybody else who wants to talk about politics is on. And so there will always be a winner. And that might not be Twitter forever. It might be a completely different platform in 10 years. But then that new platform will be will have as much agenda setting power and regulatory I don't believe power. That. I think people. allowing the purchase of Instagram or allowing the purchase of WhatsApp and then letting them kill off small company. We have done everything possible to solidify their power. There was no action in the Obama administration. I mean, the Obama administration gets off the hook on this. I don't put, I mean, look, it was the Trump. I can't stand Trump, but boy, was it the Trump administration who finally pushed through the, the Justice Department law. So we get Google. I've been talking about Google, 98%, like whatever, search. That's crazy that we have allowed that to go on, like in terms of, of, of with no regulation. Um, same thing with the, the FTC finally moved. Now, the FTC is an independent organization, but it finally moved during the Trump administration on Facebook and, and had years of rolling over for Facebook, which, you know, with those ridiculous parking ticket fines and everything else. And so I think that it, these companies will continue to grab power until the government asserts itself. And they could assert itself in other ways, by the way, that, that you're not thinking about, like privacy legislation that, that, that attack their business plans that are really not very, that, 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 that fuel all of this. Um, the fact that Facebook and Google control all of online advertising is not a good thing for the American public or for any advertising, anyone who wants to advertise. So there's lots of ways to get at this that, that, that create a lot of opportunity. But we don't, we, what we've done is we've given these companies a, a legal free pass and an economic free pass. And they, of course, because they're companies and they're Borgs and they want to eat everything, have gone for it. And why shouldn't they, by the way? And then once they get that big, by the two years ago, I get, did an interview with Mark Zuckerberg that was pretty famous because he said something stupid about Holocaust deniers. But what I found most difficult in that interview, besides his lack of any kind of feeling of culpability or responsibility for what had happened, was, and he's a nice guy, but which was a, even more surprising, was when he started to talk about China and how China was a threat to internet hegemony. And he's 100% correct. But his argument was, I called it the she or me argument. It's like, well, if we have she, then if we don't have me being this big, she is going to take over. And I was like, all of you suck. Like, like I don't want him, but I don't want you. Like, you're better than him, I guess. If, I, if you forced me to pick, I guess I'd pick you, but I don't want to. And so this concept of that they have to be big, they cannot be regulated, has stuck here continually. And I'm fearful that they are going to win that argument with the Biden administration and these these lawsuits, which will, you know, throttle them back a little bit and allow for more innovation won't happen. And there won't be good legislation around privacy, advertising, all kinds of stuff that our government has totally abrogated its responsibility to do. So so, so in general, I, I, I agree that many of the arguments about why these companies have to be so big uh, are wrong. I absolutely agree with you that we have to have much tougher laws to protect our privacy, that we need to uh, ensure that it's harder to buy out rising mm -hmm. competitors, uh, and antitrust law is an important tool and all of that. But I guess when, when I think about the nexus of social media and politics, I, I'm still somewhat skeptical that that will solve the underlying problems. All of these are, are good things to do in themselves, and they're going to have good economic effects, but hopefully we'll, we'll put some dollars back in the pockets of American citizens and consumers and mm -hmm. all kinds of good effects, right? I'm absolutely on board of all of it. But when it comes to social media, I guess one worry I have is this network effect that, that, that I do think is going to push people towards congregating on one social media platform. The other is that it's not clear to me whether it would be so much better if that weren't the case anymore, right? So let's imagine if, if that weren't the case anymore, let's imagine, yeah. you know, because for whatever deep problems we have on Facebook and, and Twitter, um, at least it is one platform on which people from very different political sides and directions um, debate with each other, often in a very insincere way, uh, you know, with lots of lies being spread and so on. It's hardly an ideal platform, but at least they're on one platform. And I guess I wonder whether if the result of um, uh, allowing competitors to, to rise better and the result of, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook banning Donald Trump and other people like that, uh, quite plausibly over a five to 10 year time frame is simply that we're going to have an ideological splitting of the internet into two parts right. where suddenly you have, you know, liberal Twitter and conservative Twitter. So? Um, and my question is whether that would be any better for American politics. So you want to essentially have a forced school dance, you know what I mean? Like, like the Jets and the, 
you know, I feel like I'm in West Side Story. Um, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm fearful that that's going to be the effective result. Do you imagine that, that that's not that the case already? Of, and of we some... already do that. We already do that in a physical sense. We already don't listen to those people. I mean, like, I, I think back, um, you know, I... I'm gay, and but I was gay at a time when it was not a good thing to be, and it was very dangerous uh, when I was coming out. Now it's definitely easier, it's not easy, but I don't recall them caring about my point of view back then or wanting to know about me or anything else. And so I think this existed, we, we try to pretend that this is new and fresh, People did not communicate between rural and urban. They just didn't. And that was because of all kinds of sociological reasons, economic reasons. I just think this is the, this is this, un, there's got to be better ways to bring people together than getting them on a platform that, that focuses on enragement. Like this is not, if we're going to want to do a school dance together, this isn't the dance we want to be in because it, it completely facilitates engagement, which leads to enragement. And it's not the good place to get together. We aren't going to suddenly, except for this Bernie Sanders meme, like seriously, we all agree that's funny, right? Like we all feel good about it. It's funny, ha, ha, ha. But there's very little commonality. Those things have to happen in churches. It has to happen with politicians that don't sow divisions. It has to happen in you know, I'm, I've always been a proponent that we should have national service of some kind, even if it's army service, you know, but by the way, back when I wanted to do that, I couldn't because I was gay. Like, again, like there's, it's really, you wanted to join the army? Oh yeah, I totally did. I couldn't, I couldn't, I wanted, I would be in the army right now if I could, uh, if I'm too old now. I know this is a complete tangent, but this is, this is fascinating to me. Yeah, what what, what attracted you army. to the army? My dad was in the army. My dad was in the Navy. He was a career, not a career Navy. He, the Navy, the Navy put him through medical school and college paid. He was not, did not have money. Uh, and he served until his thirties, his mid thirties. And he died suddenly, right when he got out actually. Um, and my family has a long military history and, and I wanted to go in the military and and was not able to because I'm, it was don't ask, don't tell. Thank you very much, Bill Clinton. Um, and I really, I, I ask and I tell, so it was hard. And I really wanted to serve the country. I really thought it was an important thing. And I thought it was a real place where people come together, for example. That was, hmm. believe me, the, the military is not perfect. There's sexism issues, there's racism issues. I, it's, it, it's a reflection of our entire society. But um, I did want to serve and I thought I would go into the CIA or, or, or that kind of service or military intelligence and stuff like that. And I just wasn't able to. Hmm. Um, so it's, I, it was a, I went to the foreign service school at Georgetown too. Um, so that was my goal before getting into reporting, but I was actually blocked. I was actually blocked, but that's whatever. It, I, I'm sure the military will survive the lack of being, being general Swisher. Um, but, but it was it, it, this idea of commonality. This is not the place to do it. I, I think we've lost the idea we had three networks and two newspapers or one big newspaper in every city. By the way, those people left out everyone else. It was facilitated towards white people, towards men, towards the rich. Um, so I'm not sure how we bring people together, but I don't think this particular medium really lends itself well to that at all. I think it lends itself to anger and manipulation. I think it lends itself to uh, trickery and propaganda. Um, and it is my great hope that it could, because that's why, you know, when I started covering the internet, I thought, just like you were just saying, this is a place we can finally see each other. You know, we can s finally see our global, our global commonality. And instead, it's broken us apart. And it it reminds me, I have this theory, I have this, I'm thinking of writing a book on this. You're either a Star Trek or a Star Wars person in life. Okay. Star Trek is about if you just travel to the far reaches of the globe, even though you might have problems, you will all come together mm -hmm. as one man, right? It has such a hopeful feeling that, that in the end, everyone is better. Every time, every movie, there's right, always right. a villain, but it's always better. Right. And everybody, you know, this sort of incredibly diverse group of people, get together and they are a team. It's wonderful vision of, of humanity. Then there's Star Wars, which is not a good, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. even the heroes suck. Like they just, yeah, they're yeah. all flawed. Nobody's good. And even, and the villains aren't bad too. So it's really complicated. And in the end, nobody, there's always going to be another empire, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they're, they're, nobody wins. And even in the end, it's not settled. People die you might see another rise in, in an empire or something like that. And so that's a very dark vision. And so the internet, Star Wars, Wars, Star Wars, the the internet, what? Where, where would you put the leaders in Silicon Valley? And do you think that they transform? Star Wars. I mean, it sounds to me like the people 
who 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 founded and ran Google certainly would afford of themselves Star more Star Trek people yeah. at the time of founding, and perhaps yeah. over time have become yeah. more Star Wars people. And perhaps that's perhaps that's I mean the old sort of uh, slightly silly seesaw that you know if you're not a um, uh, liberal at 20, then you have no yeah, heart, yeah. not a conservative yeah. at 30, you have no brain. I'm, uh, perhaps there's some, perhaps the, the sort of a, a different way of putting that is that a lot of people evolve from Star Trek to yeah. Star Wars over That's the course true. of their lives. I think our world is like Star Wars, though. I mean, I you would hope that we could aspire to Star Trek, right? You hope that that's the way it goes. And I did believe that at the beginning of the internet age. I did. I was like, wow, this, the and, and by the way, those possibilities are still there, except, mm. comma, humanity. And humanity always manages to take, you know, a wonderful tool and turn it into a weapon. Like anyone who has children, especially I have two young boys and I also have a daughter, but like I used to be fascinated by that. Like everything is a weapon. It was mm -hmm. so funny. Like here's a stick. It's a gun. Like here's a this. It's a, and I don't mean to say my kids are particularly aggressive. They're not actually. They're raised in San Francisco by two lesbians. So really, we're, gonna, we're, we're pretty good here, you know, in terms of hoping that they will be good young men. But, um, but they, I, I think these tools unencumbered do lead to depression. And by the way, systemically, there's one thing we don't look at is the systemic issues, the, the addiction issues around them. These are addictive things. Mm. They are. They just are. Um, this is uh, uh, the the idea that you can um, that you can be easily fooled is very much a part of it. The idea that you uh, it makes you lonelier and makes you depressed. Those we can't ignore those things um, because what they do is they take it and they turbocharge depression, like and and feeling alone and feeling FOMA and feeling. You know, I just there's a so lot. I, so, I have, so I have so I have a question about that, which is that um, you know I went through some of this evolution too. I, I started to teaching a course called Democracy in the Digital Age um, mm -hmm. that have it as a freshman, basically to teach from better writing. Sure. Um, you know, I don't know when I first taught. Perhaps in 2013. I may be off on that. Um, and even then, which is not that long ago, you know, the main goal of my class was to get people to see the potential downsides of, yes. of the internet and so on, because we were still in a moment when it seemed obvious that it's going to transform the world for the better. And as yeah. somebody who's, you know, always wants to see the other side of the argument that everybody was making, it's like, look, I think there's all kinds of reasons to think the internet might make things better, but here's some of the reasons to worry that it might make things worse. And you know, my students at that time would still look at me with very weird eyes when I try to say some of those things. It's like, all what great. Are you going on about? This is sort of abstruse, you know? And now I feel like everybody's on the other end of it and saying like, well, you know, making everything worse. And, 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 and I agree that, it, that there's a compelling argument for that. I wonder whether, you know, we're still in the very, very infancy of all of these platforms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when a new drug comes on the market, you are, you are likening it to addiction. A lot of people try it, a lot of people take it. And then over time, Yes, that tends to tends to slow down, and I wonder I mean, whether TV was the idiot box, right? TV had a really bad effect until it had a. Now it's kind of great. TV's kind of great, right? Like but, nobody yeah, insults. So it, it transforms now. the. So I wonder whether or all the chuckle some of the worst things about social media will moderate over time. Whether people, <sighs> you know, causing drama on the internet or. Uh, or trying to sort of gang up on people because they're sort of deliberately misunderstanding something they said, or, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're, we will have an emergence of social norms where people say, well, if you're doing that, you're really a terrible kind of person. So, so it'll have less effect or people will have less incentive to do it. I'm still worried about the manipulability by the malevolent. The kind of social, social media platforms that people are attracted to might change. I mean, I'm really struck by the difference in feel between Reddit and mm -hmm. Twitter, for example. I yeah. actually, I, I didn't really engage with Reddit till about a year ago. I actually love it. Now I think Reddit has some small communities that are quite noxious. Well, yeah, Reddit, Reddit used to be terrible. Reddit. And then the CEO made it a point to fix it, right? He was right. He's not perfect by any stretch. They were just a snake pit over there. And then they cleaned it up. They realized this was not a good business. It's not but, a good but, business. But, 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 my main point about Reddit is the sort of the mainstream culture of Reddit mm -hmm. is actually very pleasant. It and is. I think the reason for that is the upward downward system, which yep. is that instead of surfacing as you would on Twitter, the, the tweet that half of the people really love and half of the people really hate, um, that's the tweet you're going to see, right? Whatever mm -hmm. is the most controversial, the most provocative thing that somebody said on Twitter, that's what's going to sure. be at the top of your inbox. Um, with Reddit, that's not the case because the thing that we're highlighting is the post of a comment underneath a post that has the biggest delta 
the biggest difference between people who upvoted it and people who downvoted it. So actually it ends up uh, uh, going for consensual. Right. Hope. And I guess I wonder whether over time, uh, this is one hope I might have, and I'm not sure how confident I am in it. Um, you know, platforms that are more like that will will draw more readers. Um, and perhaps platforms like, like, like Twitter and Facebook might change the algorithms to be more like that um, because people eventually may learn that the drug is bad for them and, right. and, and that we need to get off it. But I don't know how optimistic I, I am about that. I, 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 think, wonder what well, I think the problem is malevolent players will game it no matter what. And so that's the problem we really have more than anything. Like one of the stories I did a while ago was how there was an issue. Um, remember when Roseanne Barr said those shitty things about uh, Valerie Jarrett? Um, um, there, the bots were the ones that were ginning up all the anger about that. Believe me, what she said was terrible, but it was there was bot activity that were like, can you believe that? Can you believe she said that? Oh, I like what she said. Oh, what did, you know what I mean? And so they were, the same company was creating all kinds of anger that then humans glommed onto. And then when um, Sam B said not a nice thing about Ivanka Trump, not something I appreciate she saying, um, I may not like Ivanka Trump, but you don't call her the name she called her. Um, she, the bots got together and they're like, isn't Sam be awful? I hate Ivanka Trump. I, the same bots. And so then humans get glommed on. And so I, I'm worried about it, the constant trickery and malevolent players. That worries me and how they game the system. And then humans get naturally drawn in to, uh, to, to conflict. Conflict is very attractive to people. Um, and, and the second part is I do think there are lots of places. Reddit has reformed itself quite a bit. It's not perfect by any stretch. But there's other things that are really interesting. I think Snapchat remains really interesting to me because it's not set up to for it, its business plan is not set up for in, enragement, but the but the but the business plans of Twitter and Facebook are set up for enragement. They are they they they're architected in such a way that this is. Don't be surprised that this happens because mm -hmm. that's how you keep people. You keep people angry, and and fearful, and it and it works, and it's worked from the beginning of time. Well, but, and, and, but perhaps the problem actually is a self-selection of the elites, which is to say mm -hmm. that I think in my mind, the most unpleasant and toxic social media platform is the one that I myself spend most time on. And probably you spend most time on, I would guess, which is Twitter. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. and, but what's interesting about Twitter is that, you know, in terms of uh, the average American, it's a tiny portion of, tiny. of what they do, right? In terms of the total number of hours that Americans spend on a social media platform, Twitter is probably what, like fifth, mm -hmm. seventh, tenth? I don't know. It's, it's, it's not very high up. Mm -hmm. In terms of a influence it has on our political discourse mm -hmm. and on decisions in this country, it's probably the most important one. It because is. It is where every journalist, every politician, every CEO, uh, every business leader um, uh, is on to, to mm -hmm. sort of talk about those things and so on. Um, so, so I guess I wonder the extent to which, um, you know, the migration towards platforms like TikTok, I think is in many ways positive. When you look at TikTok, it's, it's less political, it's less angry, it's more joy, yeah. more creative. Well, because of the algorithm is about your likes, not about your friends. It's really interesting. So, so, they... so explain TikTok to the many listeners to this podcast who I'm sure haven't actually seen TikTok. Um, well, TikTok, explain what TikTok issue is, is China. The issue is how kind the of algorithm is different. It's owned by a company. Eventually, it's, it is operated here in this country and also in Singapore and other places. But it's owned by a Chinese company. No matter how you slice it. Many years ago, I brought this up. I'm like, wow, we got to watch what's going on there because it's a, it's the first uh, Chinese owned company that has made incursions in the United States and really others hadn't at all. None of the Chinese companies did. Um, setting that aside, I did a whole story on using a burner phone because I love TikTok. Um, so, so TikTok is a, a service that is, um, it's a lot of performative and I, 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 it's social media, but I tend to, I guess it's social media, but I guess it's communications, but I focus on media, it's media and it's creativity. And it's, so it's, it's pushed by your likes and the things you like versus that you like end up watching and, and it pushes information to you based on that versus your, what your group says or your friends. And so you, you, you tend to get pushed out of your bubble very quickly. Because people have, everybody has different likes, right? And so the algorithm, which they don't talk about a lot, but it really is facilitating something that is good about you, which is, um, it, it's good about you. It's something that's good about you. Now, there's lots of abuses on TikTok and there'll be more in the future. And they, but they're spending a lot of time having a point of view 
of taking those things down. They're not like, they're not like agonizing like Facebook, like everybody say what they want. They're like, no, everybody doesn't get to say what they want. And they did that at the start. And therefore nobody had expectations once they started taking stuff down. Um, they removed pornography, obviously they removed child pornography and all kinds of stuff, but they've been moving pretty aggressively against stuff that's really divisive. And so and no one's mad at them because what you're there for is an experience of creativity, whether you like tie dye or dancing is a big thing on it, obviously, but it's much more, it's, it could be much more than that. Lots of, I don't think we've even plumbed the depths of TikTok for what it could be. It, it sort of is ideal in terms of what Twitter could be if it was not quite, and Twitter shows those elements. It, to me, Twitter should be a news, a news I would love to see Twitter by CNN, like, like let Twitter be a news or news delivering organization. That's to me what its power is. And I think it's strength. The arguments are not good. The little tiny gets and things like that. And a place for humor and a place for, you know, a little bit of back and forth debate, but not like Ted Cruz. Saying, but, but, but isn't there, isn't there a more fundamental distinction, right? I mean, if people go to TikTok for um, entertainment and creativity and so on, um, and it's not, it hasn't historically been, and perhaps one day it will become, but it's not particularly a, a locus of political organizing and of, right. of, of opinion expression. Obviously, there's some people who try to use it for political purposes, but that really right. isn't the nature of it. Now, there, you know, I personally am much less concerned about a company saying, look, we don't want this to be a political platform and anything that's overly political or divisive, we, we, we don't allow. Now, you know, uh, there's problems with that too, because obviously political points of view are important to people and and it can even then turn to problematic forms of censorship. But sort of off the bat that, get, that raise my hackles less, you know, the, the problem with Twitter is that it is now, you know, the main place where influential people talk about politics. Yes. And so yep. who gets to speak to those influential people about politics just has much bigger stakes for the overall society and the conversation for that reason. So yep. as long as Twitter remains that, and I think realistically, that's got to be Twitter's MO. Twitter, is, yeah. I don't think, can decide to suddenly be about dog videos. That's just not going to work. Um, you know, we, we still need to get back to this basic problem of regulation, which is well, that people I, then uh, need to reset. They, Twitter should have reset expectations of what it was doing. And I think Jack is one of these. If you know him, it's like an, any conversation with him is like you're you're in the middle of an Oxford debate. Well, on one hand, on the other hand, like so he doesn't ever want to just decide. Like the New York Times picks what it wants in its pages, and it picks letters. Like we're not putting you on. We're putting you on. Look at the controversy around uh, what's his name, Tom Cotton. Just like whatever you think of that, it you know ultimately you have to set expectations of this is what we are. And so Twitter didn't do that. And so it's sort of like feeding, I always compare, I compared in a recent column to feeding a child um, sugar their whole lives and wonder why they're fat, diabetic and crazy. Like that's why, guess what? You've let them go crazy. And so I think probably a, a resetting of expectations was one thing Two, a much more clear articulation of its rules and what violates them. I think they have been random. I think they've been arbitrary. They felt arbitrary. Um, and it doesn't feel like it matter. It's like they have to, you have to know the clear set of rules. Like, you know, when you're in a city where you absolutely don't run a stop sign, you know, those cities, like, you know, you're going to get a ticket, right? And then there's other cities where it's like, you don't really have to pay attention to that, or you can build wherever you want. Like, you know what that is. So they have to, um, I think people do snap to the grid rather quickly when there's a grid to snap to. And so I think expectations need to be reset for them. Um, I think people are, they're going to have to live with people being unhappy. You know, this is our home. If you don't like it, enjoy like that kind of thing and i think they don't want to do that they want to have it every way um people in silicon valley never want to take responsibility for hard mm -hmm. decisions because they're they're soft people i don't know how else to put it they're overly wealthy they're in but speaking of bubbles these people get licked up and down all day by all and and they're all there they have a grievance they have so much in common with donald trump in terms of grievances i've never met a group of people that are more uh, aggrieved as victims who are rich and powerful in my life. Like, oh, I they come. I found that very comforting. But even the richest, and the successful <laughs> no, people they're world, worse. Those, you know, <laughs> the world is not doing doing right by them, and so on. Oh, I, we're so smart that they see our genius. Oh, ignore this, ignore this insurrection over here. Like, it's just they're they're so tiresome in that way, and they hate being questioned. 
And so, um, and they don't want to make hard decisions and be disliked. That's one of the things that, that is, they're just going to have to, they're going to have to. I, I think that we can agree on. So I, I'm still nervous, you know, I'm, I'm happy to consider, I, I'm trying to figure out where we've gotten to with this conversation, right? So number one, I, I too would prefer that, the, that, that, that what sort of effectively is the public square, even if you don't like the term, or even if that we shouldn't treat it like that, but what effectively is the forum in which everybody communicates is owned by a couple of people who get to make all of those decisions. I think that's many deep. more people, many it's more. It's either we know how to solve that or how to change that. For there's some political actions that can push it in that direction. Whether it will, I I don't know. Yeah, sure. I let me tell you some good lawsuits will take care of that. Can I just can I interject there? Some good lawsuits will take care. They will start to to do stuff if there's loss. I'm just it mm -hmm. just it tends to cl clarify the situation. And they've never been under threat. And let me just make one other point. The reason these sites are unsafe, and I say it over and over again, is because these are people who've never been unsafe a day in their lives. These, the designers and producers of these things have never been, most of them have never been unsafe a day. And not all of them, but the people in charge are very, in a very good spot in society. And most of these people have never been sued. And the minute they get that, you sort of start to learn that you have to make hard decisions. I'm sorry, you just do. You just do. It's just it's, it's a clarifying. I, I don't. My brother's a lawyer, but, you know, uh, it clarifies things rather clearly. Uh, right. Right. That's that's very uh, interesting. Yeah. Now, I mean, the second thing is, I agree that if you're going to have regulation and censorship on 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 these platforms, it has got to be consistent. And one of the things mm -hmm. that always strikes me is the deep provinciality of of Silicon Valley and of the people who are making those decisions who yeah. have their political causes they care about. And some mm -hmm. of them I agree with them and some of them I disagree sure. with them. But they are deeply in that Silicon Valley bubble where certain kinds of problems and causes are evident and others are not. And so you end up, you know, getting some people banned for things that, uh, you know, seem rather strange and small. Yep. And then you get, you know, people like uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad mm -hmm. um, uh, or for that matter, the sort of, you know, a Chinese propagandists talking about Xinjiang and so on being able to, uh, to, to spread very dangerous content without Agreed. any kind Agreed. of... Agreed. I would knock them the frig off. I'm sorry. I would too. I'd be like, no, mm. I would watch them. And then I'd knock them probably because they violated their rules. And then I guess we're still, I think what we still disagree is, you know, what realistically does regulation look like in a world where, you know, it's applied uh, in a fair way. There's three or four social media platforms rather than one. And I guess I still would have a fear that the right way of dealing with Donald Trump is not to kick him off of a social media platform. It's to not vote for him. It's not to elect him. But, mm -hmm. but, 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 but that, that, you know, we're, we're attacking the symptom rather than the cause. Um, I say, but that... he, did, he did say, go get him, go wild. It was very clear what he was doing. And so you have to, I think, look, I I'm, I'm for, I think it's okay to make choices on things and they just don't want to make hard choices and hard choices are difficult for adults, right? I adults, it's hard enough, but these people act like they're children, they're giant rich children. And so they don't want, they want it all and they can't have it all. So one accountability via liability, via legislation that attacks their, the economic situation that allows them to have hegemony. You attack that, things change. They really do. And then a push for innovation throughout and see where that goes. I have never seen a situation where innovation and more voices doesn't solve a problem much quicker. And then it's not legislated by the government. Like, do we? I don't want Ted Cruz or Chuck Schumer making these decisions. I don't. But I do like them to talk about a more uh, vibrant advertising, online advertising market. I do want them to talk about consumer privacy and what people are allowed to use. I do want to talk about how we've been made cheap dates of these internet companies because we we trade. The trade is bad for consumers. I think that starts to get at the heart of their power. And it is not, it, it, we have been here. We have had gatekeepers who were, maybe it was 30 people, but it was the same people. We've had gatekeepers. We've had big giant companies. We've had these things happen and we have fixed them for the better. Like remember when Microsoft was evil? Remember? <laughs> it was, it was, and it was. It wasn't evil, but it was causing all kinds of economic problems. The government moved in, and by the way, that wasn't a perfect case, and that didn't really work out. I'm about to talk to it with a bunch of students today about this. It was not a perfect case, but what it did was set up a, a, an atmosphere of more innovation. 
We have to think about that again and again and again. And we have to force these leaders to make their hard choices and live with them. Um, and have an ac accountability is so important here in terms of, and that's where they are. You know, it's sort of like, if you want to run this restaurant, you can't poison people. We say that to restaurants all day. Right, we say right. it to like, everybody has to tow some line and they need a line to tow and they don't have to tow anything. And they're literally, let me just, I just want you to be clear. The five most powerful companies in the world, besides Saudi Aramco, because it's at the top, is our tech companies. The 10 most richest people in the world are tech moguls. Mm -hmm. I just look at that and I'm like, okay, I see what we have to do here. We have to tax them correctly, let them pay their fair share. We've got to legislate them correctly. We've got to uh, bring them back into line with the the media, the concentration of power. And once you go to the concentration of power, that is where that's where that's where Ted Cruz is going to be happy about it. He can stop yammering on about conservative bias and focus on con con concentration of power, and that will solve it. That will that will be a solution, not solve it necessarily. So, so we've talked a lot about uh, what we should do, or what we can do. Just very briefly at the end of our conversation, sure. Cara. What's your projection? I mean, depending, I mean, irrespective of what you want, what I want, what everybody wants, what do you think this landscape will look like 10, 15 years from now? Another company in charge, another big company coming. I think, I think Facebook will not be as big as it is. I think you're, eventually things fall apart, right? I'm one of those mm -hmm. people. I'm a, an entropy kind of person. Um, and, you know, AOL was dominant and then it wasn't. Like, I, I, I'm a great believer in innovation killing off these problems eventually. But the damage that it's doing right now is really is too much at this point. So I would hope there's a national privacy bill. And I think there will be. I would hope there's some antitrust action. I don't think there's one silver bullet for any of these companies. And I don't think there's such a thing as big tech. I think there's big tech companies and they each have a separate problem. I would think there would be um, some level of fines and, and, and things like that. And then eventually um, that liability, I, I would hope there'd be liability. Now, I don't know. The Biden administration has a lot to fix, right? And it could easily slop. Believe me, I don't think it wants to rush towards this. I think it's rather friendly to tech. This administration is more friendly to tech than you realize. But I think they they understand the time is now to move. Um, but they have other. They have to fix coronavirus, the economy. So I worry that they will do almost nothing um, in this area, uh, and they'll be able to slip out of it because hey. You know, we'll get to tech, but we're saving lives. We'll get to tech, but we're fixing the economy. We'll get to tech, but we're whatever the case may be. We're dealing with the white supremacist. And I, can, how can you argue with that, right? I'd like them to deal with the white supremacist also. And Gosh, can I make one final point? One of the things that's happened, one of the things that uh, drove me crazy was pushing people underground, this idea if we don't let them speak underground. These people thrive in the light. The reason why white supremacy has has been able to recruit so much and, and same thing with terrorists, same thing with anybody is because you can see them. And I think it's a lie to say, if the FBI can find these people. We don't, we don't need to monitor them. Our government needs to monitor bad activity like this. And so this idea that they should be able to spew their endless propaganda and hate, that doesn't float with me. Charles Fisher, thanks for coming on the podcast.